So welcome to this week's webinar. My name is Kate Westfall. I'm the COO of Global Ag Investing. This is our webinar series today featuring my friend Martha Montoya. She's the CEO of Ag Tools. She's going to be taking you through a very exciting presentation and I hope you'll have lots of questions for Martha um, at the end. You can put those into the chat and I will come back to address them. Um, but please go ahead and put them in as, as they come to you. You don't have to wait until the end and we'll get, we'll get to those as many of them as we can. So Martha, thank you so much for being part of the GAI webinar series and part of the Global Ag Investing family. We're thrilled to have you and I look forward to your presentation. Thank you. So we go ahead and share the screen. And I think we are up and running. Is that right, Kate? Do you see my screen? Yes, indeed. Perfect. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Okay, so good afternoon, uh, morning for some of you. Um, I'm going to hope to entertain you today more than uh, give you a lesson on what Actus is. I think that it's much interesting for you to hear uh, fun stories about the supply chain and the ag industry and take some of my experiences uh, um, in order for you to look at the investment world from a different point of view um, from somebody who's been on the ground. So we're going to talk about data and we need the trust of the ag industry. Um, and what about this data and everybody talking about the data? So uh, I'll tell you a little bit about me because I think it's important to know about me in order to understand why the presentation today. So you can see me in a couple of pictures today because you're going to see me traveling the world. Um, literally, I have uh, developed many crops, um, anywhere from uh, grains to orange juice concentrates to even carrots or lettuce. Uh, never forget, um, uh, for example, the pineapple programs in Thailand for Mexico or from uh, Panama to Europe or even the orange programs for the MBA in the United States for one of the retailers, um, or even the cantaloupes, even going into the crown, uh, working in Guatemala or Mexico on cantaloupe programs for Del Monte for uh, different countries. Um, and even strawberries or berries uh, from Mexico and uh, Chile and Argentina all the way for different countries. Uh, but not only from the crop side of it, because that's where I have worked. It's also retailers actually going into the finished product, the juice concentrate, the finished juice into the stores or the actual uh, produce in the store. And um, behind, I always say that, uh, well, we always have known that behind a uh, great men, there are great women. Well, I'll tell you that behind this woman, there is a great, um, there is great men. And it happens to be my two brothers. Um, we are from Colombia. Gustavo is the CTO of the company and he is the database and computer science engineer. Uh, amazingly, he was one of the first engineers at Amazon. So data, uh, when they were sc is, uh, scanning the books and building the, the, the centers, he was there at that beginning when he used to have a door as a table. That was him as a young kid. And my second brother, Oscar, who is the uh, computer uh, data um, a scientist. Uh, he's an aerospace engineer. We joke because we say that he looked at he looks at the world from the outside, and that's why those algorithms are so good. Um, and many of us and, and us have behind that amazing team members who have done many things from the banking industry to the supply chain to the trucking companies and so on. And so today what I'm going to share with you comes from people who have been on the ground and have been in the different industries. And um, let's start with <clears throat> where we're going here, which is the topic itself. So what is the problem? I know that there is a problem, uh, but we're going to find a solution. And the problem is that the agricultural and the food supply chain is so fragmented. And I say this to you, walk into a supermarket and you will start pick, pick up anything that you see and you will see so many countries, whether it's the Thailand, whether it's the Peru, whether it's the um, uh, China. I mean, it, literally we have products from so many places of the world and they'll have to come to a place. And that's where we need to understand this whole supply chain and within the supply chain uh, where things come from. And so I always tell people, well, this is where you start your food and you think that famous farm to table is so easy and it's so wonderful and such beautiful pictures. But the reality is that uh, it is a tough, um, it is a tough industry. And um, 
we have gone into this whole ag tech world thinking, okay, well, we're going to increase the um, profits of the farmers because we're going to increase the yield and we're going to lower the production costs. And now we'll have to start arguing with some of them. And hopefully in a couple more months or a couple more years, people will understand where we're coming from on this whole data. So here's a farmer, and this is your farmer across the street. Your farmer in, uh, today I was in Fargo, North Dakota with this whole world of uh, um, internet, we can do that. And every single farmer, whether it's Fargo, North Dakota, or whether it's Vietnam, or whether it's Chile, or whether it's Spain, will tell you the same thing. They have no data. They have no real-time data, and therefore they're har farming, planting, harvesting without any data. And guess what? It is the same problem that is being uh, a, that is uh, for the supply chain in general. So let me um, explain that when I have to work with these large corporations that need a specific product, they need a whole blueberry program or a whole spargo program um, or an orange juice program. Um, guess what? They just don't know where. So here is Martha, go find a way find the country, find the location. Um, the data is not available for them either. Literally the data on the supply chain, which are the buyers, the trucking companies, the vessel companies, all of them are literally navigating without any data. And so you wonder, so, so how do they do it? I mean, we know they're doing it and you'll be shocked and surprised because if you start getting into the um, system and today, Several of the farmers mentioned it in uh, Fargo, spreadsheets still the way to go. Um, but guess what? Billion dollar conglomerates are still doing spreadsheets because they still the system is not, the technology in, and the data systems are not there yet. And I had an interesting conversation yesterday with a major, major corporation on technology. We need the data today. We don't need the data that went by a year ago. And so what they do is literally 4 a.m., everybody gets on that phone and start calling somebody who might know something to help them understand what's going on in the market. So the word of mouth is still very much um, important. And we know that because we survey our customers. We ask them, where do you get the data? I just called my compadre here. I called my friend in France. I called my friend in Chile. I called my friend in Chicago. And then the second part of it is the uh, Department of Agriculture and other systems across the world, which are still using um, um, units that are um, old and antique and more yet they're not communicating among themselves. Um, I think that elections among all of it show us that everything is very um, distributed in different places and the legacy systems are still not communicating. It's the same thing for our industry. So, between that, the amount of time that everybody's spending is well um, doing the most important and more unusual thing, which is the supply chain is suffering. And, um, <clears throat> and we need all of these actors. We need the, the farmers, we need the packing houses, we need the brokers. And it's a completely misalignment because everybody has different data points. But what it is the same common denominator is the thin margins. Everybody's working on very thin margins across the whole supply chain. So that makes it even more challenging because now you have to start finding out, okay, how do we uh, work with this type of, um, with, the, with, with the fact that nobody has the data. And um, proven now, and I had to change this into track, into trucks because people talk about the stadiums, the, the amount of food waste we have in the world. I talk about truck, uh, trucks because we deal with trucks in our industry. Uh, so we have 4,900 truckloads per day that we're throwing from the farm to the distribution center in the United States, the equivalent of that. So those trucks that go up and down the freeways. And I'll give you one good story. Um, uh, June, August of last year, uh, I was standing in Salinas, California, and you see all these trucks leaving uh, on the way to the southwest, southeast of the country. And nobody had realized that there was a storm coming and the trucks never made it. So all these 25 trucks that left from that cooler never made it. 
And guess what happens? Those trucks have to be sent somewhere to be thrown away because nobody realized that there was a bad weather coming because this industry is moving so fast and so sharp. And later I'll explain to you about why the 76 variables that you're going to hear me are so important. And worldwide we're spending, we're throwing away 62,300. So we're increasing yield, we're lowering cost of, my, of, of the production, but we're still wasting this amount of food. So the issue is too, not only on the side of the, um, the farm to the distribution center. The reality is that the trusted data of the market is impacting the farmers and everybody in the supply chain on the administrative side of it, on the seed side of it, on the labor side of it. It's also on the land side of it. You're investing into land that we are not sure whether these five, 10 years of production are going to return my investment. On the amount of inputs, should I invest on companies that are creating this whole new organic this or uh, soil that? And more important, research. Uh, the amount of money that we're spending on research to develop the new something to make it better. So I'll give you a couple examples on this. Um, 2010, um, I actually visited the area where they were developing the new strawberry variety. And uh, proudly my scientist was showing me the new variety called the Monterey variety. And that Monterey variety was going to provide 10,000 cases per acre versus the Alvion variety, which is 5,000 uh, cases per acre. And I was like, wow, that's great. Beautiful, long, red, more more chunkier and i my question was so when when is this pro, when is this whole production happening on the on the cycle of the plant and his answer was somewhere in between july and august summertime and then my answer my question was but uh professor so you're saying that at the same time everybody's going to have ten thousand per acre and he said yes and i said but do we understand that at the same time we also have the summer fruit coming up and the summer fruit from the middle of the country coming up that are going to impact the farmer. And his answer correctly was, I don't know, I just develop a better seed and a better, uh, a better variety. That was 2010. 2016, we lost two of the biggest shippers. It was so bloody because all of a sudden in August, we had so much strawberries in the market, flooded, and the buyers were actually uh, looking at it from, they were bringing the new fruit, which is the new crops, instead of the um, cycle of uh, strawberries that are already a little bit older, though they're, they're good fruit, they're older and they're more expensive. And now the grapes are cheaper, the peaches are cheaper. And um, that was the time of the losing of two of the bigger shippers, which still today have not recovered. That is to say that data, is not only important at the farm or from the farm out, starts before the farm. And if I have a way to start, keep going about this, we could eventually start realizing that it's not only that, but the amount of industries that we're impacting when these things happen. So um, 23 industries are always impacted and those are the ones that we think they are impacted when this whole data and supply chain is not properly monitor or audited from the buy. Obviously the first ones we think, the farmers, the shippers, the brokers, the buyers, but then you start thinking about utilities, packing houses, you start talking the freights and logistics, and then you start talking, wait a minute, governments, um, research institutions, labor contractors, NGOs, and then you go even into further and it's the banks, the lenders, the insurance, everyone starts getting impacted because nobody has the understanding of the market versus just the data from the farm. And so um, what we said, okay, we know that um, the most um, volatile industry within the ag industry is the specialty crop. And we know that that's impacting the world. Um, then we have the rest of the farming industries, which are the food, uh, the seafood, which is very also fragmented across the world, the cattle, the dairy, the poultry, the bakery, which includes several of them, the ports, the pork area, uh, and then the raw crops. 
And believe it or not, having uh, today the conversation with our farmers on uh, Fargo, North Dakota, um, they were conf they were giving me the same same elements that I mentioned to you: the fact that they don't have the data, they just have to rely on somebody. They 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 don't know how the consumer is behaving. So should they do more organic, less organic, less uh, sizing that sizing? They are really on the dark, and so there's more to the story than just that. And so you say, okay, well, so we have a problem. And so what is the, what do we do here? It's the data. The data and as a couple of major, uh, very important MIT people told me, um, you can do any machine learning, you can do any AI, but you have to have good data. And you have to find it, number one, which is one of the most important elements. You have to then ingest it and make sure that you're ingesting the right data. You have to clean it to make sure that you're not duplicating or not having the data, um, or you have to organize it on top of that. You have to process it. And the most important one, you have to audit it. And I'll give you a couple of examples. We know that uh, we all rely on data that are in the computer systems of our governments, um, but I can tell you firsthand that we have found large discrepancies where we actually have asked and they have gone to the warehouse to look at the box of 2018 or 19 to find out the real number and adjust that number because nobody had nobody's auditing these numbers and we are and in general hopefully many will keep doing that for the benefit of all of us and uh, the, the next part of it is contextualize the data because data for the sake of data is not, 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 not important, really. And to make sure that you present them in a simple, easy form. Um, I always say that my industry attention span is limited, not because we're not smart, it's because we have so much going on. And in a minute, I'll show you how that works. And so we have to be careful how we take that data and make it simple for them, but not that simple that they don't understand the globalization of what's going on around them. Because a small farmer in Michigan is impacted when something happens in Argentina and they need to keep themselves abreast of that. So here's a brain. And if, if you will always remember me in the future is for a number and it's the number 76. 76 are the amount of variables that impact at any time a farmer anywhere. They start thinking about the volume, where is the origin? They start thinking about weather patterns, but they're thinking about the weather patterns locally. As, as when they start thinking, oh, well, what, what if they start thinking what's the weather pattern in Chicago, then they start moving their brains in different forms. Um, then they have the geopolitical issues, which now we know them all, but do I start worrying about India? Should I start worrying about China? Should I start worrying about Chile? Lots of them. And then you have holidays and believe it or not in our tool the number one element that they visit is holidays because the movement of product moves around holidays heavily and so simple things like a holiday that in our mind is are not as important they're crucial for a farmer or for a shipper uh, while we're thinking that maybe it's just a price i'm going to show you our tool and not for the sake of the tool but how the brain thinks a person wakes up in the morning and they start making calls and they want to know what's the weather in different places. So think how the brain is moving right now. They need to know what is the volume, who, who has how much going or where from which country. I want to know what is the pricing? What's the terminal pricing? What is the pricing in another country? I want to know what is the FOB pricing? I need to know what is the trucking pricing? I need to know what are the holidays. I want to know what is the news somewhere because there might be a strike somewhere that I might not be able to ship. That brain has to come up with those 76 elements at any time. And so again, if you remember me forever, I'm Martha 76, meaning there's 76 variables that impact. And this is not just a number we came up. It's um, we're coming up with this number through the trees, trees theory, T-R-I-Z, which is a theory of scientific theory that says every invention has so many variables. And after um, famous scientists um, did a research said that no matter what you invent, there are always 76 variables that will impact something, in this case, the supply chain. So also leaving you with a couple of interesting elements. Um, we always know, and by the way, I'm a chess player. I love chess. Chess is one of my favorite uh, uh, hobbies. Um, you have 
the famous players on the board. And the famous players is obviously the first one and more important for me, it's always been the farmer. Without the farmer, we don't have much going on here. Uh, we have the agronomist and you have different forms of agronomists. You have the uh, PA, you have the uh, scientist agronomist, but you always have somebody involved in that farm or that operation, the agronomist. You have an economist and it's somebody who is the financial person, whether it's the wife, whether it's the son, whether it's the um, bank, somebody or the accountant is helping them uh, understand what's going on. Um, and then you have a scientist, which is the universities that come and tell them what's going on and how things are going. I believe that the biggest issue about data is that all these elements are in silos. And if you invest, I will strongly suggest having them all at the same time in the same room several times, and you will be surprised what things you start finding out about the data uh, instead of letting each one individually do the data. And today I'm going to advocate for a fifth element on that board, and it's a sociologist. And the reason for it is that um, I believe strongly that we have to remember that we're moving into an industry that is still lagging in technology. Um, a famous person from Microsoft told me um, that the ag industry adoption reminds them of the, pharmaceut of the pharmaceutical uh, going to doctors to tell them to adjust. And what happens is in the doctor's offices, you have the grandfather, the father, and the son who have been the doctors and the doctor of the doctor. And my father always prescribed this. And therefore I'm prescribing this. And it's hard to break that because my father did it, I do it. And so the pharma industry had to come up with how do we break the cycles and start creating this new thinking process so they can use different medicines. And she was telling me pharma is more or less the same thinking process. Um, the agriculturalist, the grandfather, the father. And, and a couple of days ago, we were laughing because my grandfather is a farmer. And my father and my whole family is farmers. And even though the, my grandfather is gone, we still think how he would have done it, even though he's no longer around. And I mentioned that and everybody started laughing because the 40s and 50s are laughing like, oh my gosh, it's the same thing. In, it's like you're talking to us. We, we have that tradition. And so we need to start analyzing a little bit more in depth who we are. So I suggest strongly to start looking more in sociology and philosophy or psychology to get into this whole investment world and move it for all of us. And I am an example of that because I wasn't going to say, go do something and we don't do it. Uh, when we wrote the business plan, I went to Stanford and obviously because it's the place to go to do their business plan. But then I said, let's validate this. And we went to UC Davis and we validated with 75 industry holders, write down what they wanted, who they wanted, how they wanted it. And then we went to UC Davis and, and UC uh, Davis slash uh, UCI. UCI has one of the best soci uh, sociology departments in the world. And, and we housed the office, the company there. And under the uh, provost, we started the research that we're doing right now in understanding farmers because it's the generational differences. It's also the uh, sex differences, fathers and, and, and fa fathers and daughters. It is the different type of crops, different, um, different type of crops, a tomato crop uh, versus a, um, a soy farmer, different mentalities. And so we did that ourselves and we still resident there. And I think we'll never move uh, as long as we can stay there because it keeps giving us data that we can use to make, bring the data, make it easier for everybody to understand. So what is our challenge? And this is our challenge. And, and I put ourselves as an example. How do we make things easier for people to read, uh, for farmers to read, for stakeholders to read, when the attention span is not even two seconds because I have 200 truckloads moving fa fast or I have 100 truckloads or the season started, I don't need to, to talk to you about anything else but my farm. And uh, it will always be how do we deliver to everyone in a very simple form without, the, um, without losing the content. Because what we have to be careful, and I have been asked a couple of times, is make it very simple. But this is not an easy, simple industry. Because it's, as I, when we started the conversation, it's very global. 
So um, I have had a couple of farmers say, well, can you just give us the data of any, everything Chicago or anything Florida? Yeah, but let me tell you, um, if uh, Argentina devaluation happens, they will dump products on the market and Michigan will get impacted or California will get impacted or North Dakota will get impacted because they will start dumping it. So you need to stay alert and abreast of many areas now. So farmers have to be a little bit more sophisticated in understanding the data. Um, so with that, I closed uh, the presentation at 1130, uh, just mainly because I wanted to hear from you, have any questions um, and tell you a couple of stories as we close. When I was asked to develop uh, the juice concentrate uh, uh, program in Brazil, uh, one of the interesting things was that I had to deal with the um, um, how to source it and how to ship it. And within that process, how to deal with farmers. And that was my first encounter with farmers in a country, Brazil with Portuguese versus United States or Spanish, which were my native languages. And sitting down with the farmers understood pretty soon they were the same problems there and that's when i got going through my career the same problems which are you tell me how much i'm going to make and when i'm going to get paid it's the common denominator so if i would travel to vietnam i would hear that if i would go to pakistan i would hear that yes all the technologies you want to tell me all the, the best practices you want to give me but if you're setting up a whole mango plant here in Pakistan to ship mangoes from here, when I'm going to get paid and how I'm going to get paid. And so if we can make easier for farmers the understanding of that through data and make it simple, but at the same time, as we invest, because we invested projects of 20, 30 million dollars investments and plants and USD approvals and all type of um, um, NGOs and organizations approvals. The idea is that we take that individual, which is the most important one in the investment and explain to them in a simple form why the data of what they're getting will make their life easier to make themselves more uh, profitable. And that that consignment industry that he lives on um, is able to return the investment. Now, on the financial side of it, um, a story that I will tell you is um, when uh, we were developing a whole program of um, uh, mangoes in Peru, uh, I would go to the bankers and I would get the $20, $30 million to invest into this whole amazing programs. And they will understand that it could be a risky situation. So we had the war. I want to say 1990s, we had a war between Ecuador and Peru, and we had over 25 million on the ground with our mango program and a lot of USDA executives there, um, jumping on the plane and rerouting the trucks that instead of Ecuador through Peru. The second thing I learned fast, remember the first one was how much and where is the investment. The investors now are on the line and they need to understand how they're going to get their return on investment. And the data is the data of the on real time data. And I saw the war ahead of time through the reading of the articles that I had uh, to make sure that I would jump ahead of time and reroute the trucks. So data is not just the farm, uh, if there's a conclusion here. Data engages the 76 variables that we keep talking and we anybody can call me or talk to me and I'll tell you many of them, but it's a holiday, it's a war, it's a strike, it's a tradition, it's a, Tradition, give you one good example. Um, I had to ship a banana boat per week from, uh, from uh, Ecuador to St. Petersburg through Panama Canal. Well, guess what? Every Monday I would get my workers until 10 a.m., 11 a.m. because they come with a hangover. And I couldn't understand on the fourth week is my vessel will arrive and I couldn't get this going. A lot of money on the ground on this program. And I just couldn't understand until I went to the ground, I mean, to the farms, um, to the town, found out that the gentleman will pick up their money on Saturday and they will go drinking until Sunday evening, uh, all the money that they had received on Saturdays. Um, two things that were wrong. One, they get drunk too long and I couldn't get my workers on Monday. And two, guess what? The families wouldn't have money because they, he will drink the money. So going with the family that I was working the program with to the capital and adjusted 
the system, um, I mean, the legislative system to allow us to take 50% of that money and put them in a cooperative for food. So we would pay the gentleman 50% cash and the other 50% stay in this cooperative to give rice and beans and um, a protein to the family members. So now the gentleman had only 50% of the money. So he will arrive home around 5, 6 p.m. instead of midnight. And guess what? Workers will show up at 6 a.m. to start working. My logistics went up immediately. My time sets were fine. I will make it to the Panama Canal on time and I wouldn't have to overpay for not being on time to, to cross the Panama Canal. So all these data points are so crucial in this whole industry. I will ask you to dig into when you're doing the investments a little bit deeper into this type of small details that could implement in the case of a vessel, a couple hundred thousand dollars literally per hour because of lack of passing a small bill that not only helped socially impacted the families, but it definitely helped the family, which that program is still running 25 some years later um, from that vessel keeps going to St. Petersburg with bananas. And so um, that would be my advocacy. So with that, um, Kate, I think that um, I could sit down and give you 20,000 stories more, but hopefully that will be enough. <laughs> Thank you. I, I could listen to a few more and maybe some will come up as we go through a couple of questions. Um, if you could stop your share screen, just so that people can get a better visual. Okay. Thank you. Um, so I wanna talk about, it sounds like sort of a, a very global macro view of data and so many of the technologies that we've seen over the last um, six years or so have been very much, you know, point of farm data and sensors and things like that. So this, this is something very different when we're talking about big data for ag. So I wanted, there was a slide that you had that showed all of the different players who are impacted or could potentially be um, from these data sets. And I wonder if I could understand a little bit better, are you collecting data from each individual along the chain? Is everyone contributing to a larger pool of information? Um, how, how is this being collected to then provide back to the farmer? So the tendency and the investment world has gone towards anything that the farmers produce data with because it's the safest thing. I put a couple million dollars, I'm going to get 50 uh, farmers, they give us the data, we make their life easier, we create a, a system and now we can duplicate and sell somewhere else. That makes sense and that's what the whole ag tech world is going towards. Ours is a little bit different, We're call it, we call it the middle mile, which is between the farm and the distribution centers, there are a lot of set data sets that nobody, individuals have, but the market has. So we collect data from all type of AP, behind the behind, U.S. Customs, the Mexican government, uh, OAS, I mean, all these in institutions that daily and by the minute are collecting data, but it's neutral data. It's not data from individuals. So I'll give you an example. Uh, one of our customers, they pack carrots, every single, the largest carrot producer in the world. They pack the carrots. They have to go through a pro packing house and when they go through the packing house that goes uploaded into a system that is the government system to see how many were shipped that day that is the data that and many other shippers will put that data in a system we plug it we take it from there so our data is all neutral not individual but through the system of the government okay so that's that's like it, we have a question coming in asking how you integrate open source data is that sort of what mm -hmm. we're Okay. It's open source data uh, with the understanding that the open source data um, comes from individuals that bring it to the government and the government we grab down and um, clean up, set up and scrap and all that. But more important, uh, because I didn't want to get into deep into this, uh, every, every, co every commodity, um, we have 500 on the, on the dashboard, every commodity has different varieties and they behave different in different parts of the world. So Kate, uh, if you want to predict the future of blueberries or you want to predict the future of anything anywhere in the world, you have to understand what variety or what um, um, system, uh, what, which one of them are there because they behave different and then the volumes are completely different. Interesting. 
I think another one of the questions that came up was, you know, obviously you're targeting this information to the farmer. Is there potential for all those other players along that supply chain to also be customers? Uh, Definitely. Um, yeah. We already have uh, financing institutions that are using the data okay. because they, the first reaction of people is, oh, but this data already exists because the world of ag has always thought about uh, ag as soy and beans and rice, which are the raw crops of the Midwest. And then they want to look at this. Wow, there's not there's nothing. Um, and there is reason for that. Um, the specialty crops, uh, which are the fastest growing segment in the world, because millenniums are now eating healthier and Gen Z's are eating healthier and baby boomers by default have to eat healthier. Um, the specialty crop is the one that has now, they, they have no data in real time. So we're providing that. But what is interesting is that in the Midwest, as we start to work with farmers, the farmers themselves don't have their data themselves about their integration of the phenological phases of the, of the plants plus the market. And that integration, when I mentioned, make sure you have a scientist and you have an agronomist and you have a farmer. There is a reason I push for that because all sitting on the same table, you start listening to things that you will never have listened because if you're a financier, just listen to numbers. If you're an agronomist, and I see that all the time in the investment world, they get together with a farmer and then they get together with accountant. I would suggest strongly to have everyone on the same table because you'll be surprised the things you start hearing that now in the financial model, you can build it around that. Okay, interesting. Um, uh, someone's asking if you have uh, information on cacao in the platform. On the what? Uh, well, within AgTools, if you if you track cacao. Cacao? Uh, uh, cocoa plants, cacao? Uh, cocoa plants, cocoa, cocoa plants, yeah. Yes, we do. We have it on the back end. Uh, We're putting them the front end by January, but yes, we do cocoa, coffee, um, um, yes. Okay, great. Um, I think there, there's also curiosity around, you know, outside the open source data, is there a way to get all of your supply chain stakeholders to provide high quality data that they have been reluctant to share in the past? That is a, a good question in a sense that um, we are more like a Bloomberg of the industry, meaning a new, neutral party to the data. Um, and we want to keep it like that because what we want is to make sure that we bring transparency, we, we, we make things available to the people for everyone to decide how to manage uh, their market. So I'll give you one example. One of our major customers is uh, one of the large consulting groups in the world. And what they do is they take the data um, because it's neutral. So they say, we can now suggest to customers things because we see that this is a neutral data versus it's a skew towards somebody. And the other reason also, Kate, is, um, and it's starting to happen also in, in the raw crops, there's more, um, and, and by the way, let me step back. I come from a country where coffee was always given to the coffee federation you had no choice. You farm and you had to give it to the coffee farm foundation. So I always heard my grandpa complaining all the time. Oh, I don't know what they're doing. Some days, some years are good. Some years are bad. I don't control my destiny. I, it's by law that I have to give this. Uh, I would say 15, 20 years ago, that was open. And, and now you control your destiny. You were able to sell whenever you could sell and sell whenever you, you, you're able. And if you failed, that was your responsibility. And if you didn't, that was your responsibility. So now, now in Colombia, you have only so much percentage you have to give to the Coffee Federation and the rest you can sell on your own. Starting to, I started to see that in the Midwest where people are starting to say, can I just sell my own? If, if I'm going to fail, let me fail on my own. Let me take my destiny on my hands. So that is happening across the whole world. Um, and it has to do with this whole farm to fork and the farmers markets and the um, unfortunate situations with China. Um, it's like, I kind of no longer trust my ecosystems. I need to start doing it on my own. So I see more 30, 40 uh, year um, farmers uh, starting to decide to do it on their own. And so that's why data is becoming more important for them because now no longer they want to rely on that potential coffee federation that gave them the information, but I want to know directly what's going on so I can decide whether I want to send it to Saudi Arabia or I want to send it across the street. 
and make my own decision. You segued perfectly into my next question. And you mentioned, you know, short attention spans, everybody's busy. I wonder how much time you're needing to spend with each farmer customer to onboard them and explain um, how it works and, and why it's useful to them to understand this kind of data. Uh, this is an issue that is not only mine, it's a, in general, everybody that I've talked with, that's why the sociology uh, path has been very important for us. Um, it, it's, it's how simple you make things simple, but this is the funny thing. When we show the dashboard, the first reaction is like, whoa, that, that's a lot of information. And then we say, okay, think 4 a.m. You just got out, you're ready on your truck, you're bringing your coffee in your hand or tea and uh, you're driving and what do you start doing? You start making phone calls. Whom do you call? And they say, I want to call, well, I want to find out the volume. Okay, they call ABC person. I want to know, call this person. So they do, they do process in their brains, the needs and the questioning to get the answers. Now, what we have to do in this whole act deck is how do we transfer that? No longer do it on the phone, no longer doing the old traditional way, but the other get into the systems. And today, for example, I heard an amazing uh, farmer, 4,000 acres of soybeans and all that, doing it still in spreadsheets. And he doesn't trust anybody else to do it. And are we going to help them convert this to make it easier? Uh, so, I, and, and then his comment were like, these people from Silicon Valley, if they work two weeks here, they will understand why spreadsheets are much easier we go back to the same thing it's it's a it's a, a the onboarding is not easy but i believe in our case the reason for the onboarding easy is uh, we come from families that educated adults and so i was a teacher of 50 year old people and i understand that you have to be patient but once you're patient they're in for it but you have to have certain tools which we have um, to engage them Great. And then let's end maybe on, on the financials. There's a, another question that's come in and something I was curious about as well. Um, throughout the research that you've conducted to create this product um, and as people begin to adopt it, do we know how that will impact the potential value financially to the producers? Um, is there a way to predict? Yes, know, definitely. Here? And we already have case studies you see, every farmer has farmed based on historical how they have farmed. And they're just a little bit here, a little bit there, what they heard last year, what they think they heard last year. What now our farmers are looking is, let me see the last 10 years of market, how the market has behaved. If every June from 1st of June to 5th of June, the prices are $5 or 10, or and normally they should be 15, why am I harvesting? for that week, because historically showing that that is a bad week. And when you look at the, in a different, in the next level, you see that there's a weather pattern, which is very strange, but it happens every June, first week of June or last of May, as a storm that happens through Midwest or Chicago or somewhere, which is one of the destinations. And they say, okay, well, now I understand that I'm harvesting to go and throw them. So we see now farmers harvesting because of the market even planting. So we have large companies already planting for 2021 and 2022 um, 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 investments because now they see 10, 15 years in 10 minutes of historical data. So that is, for me, that's been the most uh, pleasurable uh, experience to see that farmers can and will be able to see if you give them a simple, the data fast and simple, they can make better decisions. They can predict their own future, literally. Perfect. That's a great way to end. And I think anyone who has more questions for Martha, please contact her. Her email address is martha at ag.tools. And uh, that information will be on the Global Ag Investing webinars page as well. Martha, thank you so much for sharing so many stories and so many insights. This has been a really nice way to digest what I think is a very big idea. So thanks very much for putting it together. Thank you, Kate. And thank you, everyone, for listening. Stay safe out there, everyone. See you next time.